Our, our speaker today is uh, Professor Yutian Wu. She's from the Department of Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences in Purdue University. She's been there uh, almost a year now. She got her PhD, uh, I'm sorry, go back. She got her Bachelor of uh, Science from, uh, where was it? The University of Science and Technology in China. She came over to do a PhD at, uh, in the Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics Department at Columbia University. She got a PhD a couple of years ago. Then she went to do a postdoc at the Courant Institute of New York University. She spent a couple of years there. She's published a number of papers. Her interests are in large-scale dynamics, general circulation, uh, the, the dynamics of storm tracks, and variations associated with climate change and ozone depletion. And today she's going to talk about some new work uh, looking at the tropopause, the mid-latitude tropopause, and the role of moisture. Yep. Thank you, Gil. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So hello, everyone, um, and thank you for um, the introduction. Um, so um, it's, it's really my pleasure to come over here to give this talk. And the talk will primarily focus on um, the height of the mid-latitude tropopause, especially the role from the near-surface moisture. And this work is in collaboration with uh, um, Professor Olivier Paloui at New York University and also Professor Tiffany Shaw at Columbia University. So first of all, just a brief introduction about the tropopause and uh, the importance of the, the tropopause. So as we know that the tropopause is a layer that separates uh, the turbulently mixed troposphere and the, the stable stratosphere. And this is just an example of that, which shows the tropopause pressure in thick black line derived from the cosmic satellite observations. And uh, you can see that the, the tropopause height is higher at lower latitude and gradually um, decreases um, in terms of height um, towards higher latitudes. And the tropopause is important because it's important for the troposphere stratosphere exchange of water vapor and other chemical constituents. And uh, here's an example from Randall and Park in 2007 where they showed the air's observations of water vapor on the left and the ozone concentration on the right at upper levels. And as you can see here, that in July and August, there is a high value of water vapor that's located over the South Asian monsoon area, whereas there's a low concentration of ozone um, in pretty much similar areas. And both of these uh, appear to be co-located with uh, the Asian monsoon, um, so Asian monsoon uh, upper level anticyclones, which are highlighted by the white dashed curve in this plot. And also the tropopause is important because it's the important indicator of climate change. And here's a plot showing the time series of the anomalous global mean tropopause pressure from two reanalysis, the NSAP and the ERA40 reanalysis. And if you pay attention here that um, in addition to the tropopause variability that's associated with uh, the volcanic eruptions, there is a consistent rising trend in, tro in the global mean tropopause pressure, in tropopause height, especially over the uh, second half of the 20th century. And what's more in the study is that they further attributed the rising trend of the tropopause height into uh, individual forcing agencies. And they found that um, the rising trend is primarily due to both um, the greenhouse gas increasing the atmosphere, which is showing the, uh, the green curve, and uh, the ozone depletion in the stratosphere, which is showing the, the purple curve. So there have been um, many studies trying to understand the tropopause. And one of the very first ones was from HELD 1982, where they uh, suggested dividing the problem into radiative and dynamical constraints. So underlying the radiative constraints, it's assumed that the stratosphere is in radiative equilibrium, and the tropospheric collapse rate is independent of height. So the hypothesis underlying that is if we know something additional under, from the dynamical constraint, we'll be able to solve the two unknowns from the two equations, and the two unknowns are the height of the tropopause and the other is the uh, static stability of the troposphere. So underlying the uh, dynamical constraint, the first group of people um, 
pay attention to the use of the dry uh, balconic eddy dynamics. And they are assumed that uh, um, the dry stability in the atmosphere, which is the vertical gradient of potential temperature, and relate that to the meridional gradient of potential temperature. And it works well in um, idealized dry models, but not really in reality. And um, so another group of people emphasized the role of moist convection in the extra tropics, just like the convection in the tropics. And what they did is they relate the moist stability in the atmosphere, which is the vertical gradient of uh, the equivalent potential temperature to the half the standard deviation of the equivalent potential temperature, which can be further related to the meridional gradient of equivalent potential temperature. So the vertical gradient is now related to the meridional gradient of theta e. And finally, it has also been argued that stratosphere is all, the, the large scale circulation in the stratosphere is also play an important role in shaping especially in meridional structure of the, uh, of the extratropical tropopause. So as for the moist scaling theory, uh, a study from Frierson and uh, Davis in 2011 used uh, the MERA reanalysis data set and uh, compared the moist scaling theory on the left and uh, the dry scaling theory on the right. And what they found is that the theory, which is uh, the meridional gradient of theta e, actually matches well with the vertical gradient of theta e in the vertical, and which is characterized by a correlation about 0.87, and it's much better than the dry scaling theory counterpart. And it's also found that um, the moist scaling theory also works much better in the southern hemisphere, which is shown here, than the northern hemisphere, which is shown here. And the correlation now drops to 0.7, but still is much better than the dry scaling theory uh, dry, dry scaling theory counterpart. So the importance of the extratropical moist dynamics is also reflected when you look at global atmospheric circulation, especially by comparing the circulation constructed on dry versus moist isentropes. So here shows the, uh, the um, isentropic stream function on theta surfaces and on theta E surfaces in annual and zonal averages. And uh, you, you can see that the, the, um, the dry isentropic circulation is comprised of, a, of actually two, two uh, overturning circulation in the two hemispheres, which transport high theta value from the equator to the pole and low theta value from the pole back to the equator. And that's... Um, that's quite. That's pretty much similar in the in the. Um, if you construct global circulation or moist uh, isentropic surfaces, but you may notice that there is a remarkable difference in terms of the circulation intensity. And uh, the the circulation intensity of moist isentropes is about twice as much as the moist as the circulation intensity when you do the calculation on theta surfaces, and. Um, the reason for that is when we do, um, when we calculate the isentropic circulation on theta E surfaces, it better captures this red arrows in this plot, which carries the low level poleward moving warm and moist air parcels and lift them up into the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. On theta E surfaces, it can better separate the thermodynamic property between the red arrows, which are moist well, warm and moist, and uh, uh, the blue arrows, which are cold and dry. So there is a di substantial difference in terms of the theta E values. However, these two tend to cancel out if you just do the calculation on theta surfaces because of the similarity in, um, uh, in theta values. So uh, back to the tropopause. So um, one of the definitions for the tropopause is the uh, is defined based on the two PV unit of the potential vorticity. And another definition of that is based on the dry isentropic stream function. And following Schneider 2004, it identifies the theta surface that's corresponding to about 10% of the maximum stream function. And um, 
the physical meaning underlying that is, is assumed that 90% of the equator will return flow that take place uh, near the surface is actually balanced by um, the poor branch that's taking place within the troposphere below the tropopause. So that's why the 10% comes up. So to see how it's actually related, um, here I'm plotting the dry isentropic stream function in DJF versus JJA uh, using the uh, ER interim reanalysis. And you can see um, the black dashed curve shows the dynamical tropopause, the GPV unit of potential vorticity, and the black crosses show the maximum of the string function, and the pink circles indicate the 10% of the maximum string function. And you can see that the dynamical tropopause and the 10% of the maximum string function in general overlap with each other, and it agrees well in both the no northern hemisphere, winter time, southern hemisphere in both seasons, but not really in the northern hemisphere summertime. And you can see the, uh, um, the, the symbols pretty much jump everywhere. And the reason for that is um, if, we only do, if we only calculate the, dry, the, ice and the circulation on, dry, on theta surfaces in northern hemisphere summer, it turns out to be very weak. And therefore, it's very hard to define where the maximum of the string function nor the 10% of the maximum string function. So instead, we turn to the moist isentropic string function. And in particular, we try to make use of a, a methodology of a statistical transform Euler mean that's developed in Palui about 2011. So the methodology aims to approximate zonal mean circulation in arbitrary vertical coordinate, which could be pressure, theta, or theta e, or any kind of variables that you can think of. And um, as before, the string function is calculated by summing up the meridional mass transport with cosy tilt, with, uh, with cosy tilt uh, smaller than a certain value of cosy. This is coordinate. But the key point underlying the, um, the STM framework is that the meridional mass transport is now estimated as a product of the meridional velocity and a bivariate Gaussian distribution as function of a V and a C. And the, the F function is, is a, a bivariate Gaussian distribution, which is written up here. So bars here indicate both monthly and zonal averages, and primes are uh, deviations from uh, monthly and zonal averages. So V prime, C prime bar here include uh, both stationary and the transient eddies. So if you uh, go through all the, um, the derivations that I've showed you, and you are eventually end up with an uh, uh, analytical formula for the isentropic stream function, which turns out to has, have two components. One is the Eulerian mean component, and the other is the eddy component. So the Eulerian mean component, as you can imagine, it's, um, it, it has a maximum near the, uh, in, in the tropics, which captures the Halley cell. The eddy circulation has a maximum in the extra tropics, um, and the sum of the two will give you um, the total STM string function, which, uh, which qualitatively agrees well with uh, um, the, the isentropic stream function, if you just do the standard calculation of that from the daily variables. So what we are doing here is that we actually make use of the analytical formula from the STM st uh, stream function, in particular the, the eddy stream function that's dominated in the extra tropics. And this is the analytical formula for that. So it's V prime theta E prime, the eddy meridional flux of equivalent potential temperature multiplied by a Gaussian distribution and further integrated over the whole atmosphere column. So V prime theta E prime, what does V prime theta E prime look like? So V prime theta E prime, um, the results here show the V prime theta E prime in DJF versus JJA as a function of latitude and pressure levels. And um, the red curve highlights the vertical profile of V prime theta E prime um, that's located, for example, at about 30 degree north. 
And you can see that in both seasons, it has a maximum near the surface, not too much contribution from the upper levels. And if we can further idealize the vertical profile of V prime theta E prime, just as a delta function that maximizes near the surface, then we can go from the analytical formula for the eddy stream function to the next step. So the vertical, pro the vertical integral is now gone, and every item now is evaluated near the surface, including the eddy flux of uh, equivalent potential temperature, the mean, um, the, time and, uh, uh, the time and the zonal average of theta E that's evaluated near the surface, as well as the variance of the equivalent potential temperature. So by now, we can ask where the, temp where the maximum of the eddy stream function is achieved. And from this, from this formula, it's achieved when the exponential term goes to exponential zero, which is equal to the theta E value equal to the, the monthly and zonal average of the equivalent potential temperature near the surface. This turns out to be true. If we look at, um, if we look, if we look at the uh, moist isentropic stream function, so here's the, the moist isentropic stream function in DJF versus JJA. And you, you may notice that in northern hemisphere summertime, there's a much larger circulation on theta E surfaces. And also, the, again, the black crosses indicate the maximum of the stream function. And the, the black think line, uh, think line show the uh, time and zonal average of the equivalent potential temperature near the surface. And you can see the two basically overlap with each other, except for some differences at northern hemisphere higher latitudes right here. So now we move forward and ask where the 10% of the maximum stream function is achieved. And that's when the exponential term goes to exponential minus 2, which is about 10%. And that's equivalent to the theta E value equal to the mean plus two standard deviation of the equivalent potential temperature near the surface. And remember um, the definition for the tropical path. And we can further relate the 10% of the maximum stream function to the tropical path potential temperature. And now the tropical path potential temperature is directly related to the mean plus two standard deviation of the equivalent potential temperature near the surface. Or in other words, it's, it's usually the large, a, a very large and rare fluctuation of theta E that's able to rise more or less adiabatically to the height of the tropical path and further modulate the tropical path potential temperature. And we found this a formula to, in, in qualitative agreement with, what's, with what was proposed in Duke's 2000, um, except that they had a factor of 0.5 in their formula. So to see how these two are related to each other, so again, plotting the moist isentropic stream function, the black dashed curve shows the dynamical tropical path, and the, the black thick one shows uh, the mean plus two standard deviation of the equivalent potential temperature near the surface. And you can see that the two has similar meridional structures except for some latitudinal shifts. And this latitudinal shift is actually reasonable in terms of representing the physics. Because as, you, as the, the moist processes um, move the low level polar moving air parcels and lift them upward into the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, they're not only traveling um, uh, over uh, in the vertical upward, but also traveling over a horizontal distance as well. And um, by our estimate here, that's about like on the order of uh, 10 degree latitude. So for, for example, if you see the low level fluctuation of theta E, for example, at about 30 degree north, it has a similar value of theta E to um, that of the dynamical tropical path, which is also true for other latitudes as well. So. Um, just, just in case that I've got you lost in all the derivations that I've showed you so far. So this is the, the moist tropical path kind of relationship that we are trying to further explore in the following. And we, in particular, we are relating the tropical path potential temperature to a large and rare fluctuation of, um, of theta E near the surface, 
with some horizontal distances uh, between the two. So next, we try to explore how this is represented in reanalysis, especially in terms of um, in both the annual cycle and interannual variability. So first of all, the annual cycle. So here, I'm showing you the northern hemisphere annual cycle. The x-axis is the mean plus two standard deviation of theta e uh, evaluated at about 850 millibar. And the y-axis is the dynamic tropopause potential temperature evaluated at about um, uh, 40 degree north. And you can see that um, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the low-level fluctuation of theta e and the tropopause potential temperature. In particular, in northern hemisphere summertime, where there is a large um, value of low-level fluctuation of theta e, you do have a large, um, a, a large anomalies of, of, of tropopause potential temperature. And uh, um, similarly, in northern hemisphere wintertime, a small value of low-level fluctuation of theta e is associated with a smaller value of, um, of tropopause potential temperature. And this relationship is, it can be actually uh, characterized by correlation and also linear regression coefficient. Both of them are very close to, uh, very close to one um, in, 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 in terms of representing the relationship. And um, we found that this is a robust feature among, uh, for, other, for, for other latitudes as well. Do you have, yeah? Mm -hmm. The latitudes, um, um, be because of the f because of the physical processes, yeah, because it um, um, the low level flow also travels over ho horizontal distances. It's kind of similar to the slant wise. Um, right, Bauer estimate is about like on the order of ten degree latitude difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for a monthly mean. Right, so the each sim monthly is on no mean, yes. So for each month. So each symbol is for each month over a 20 year period for now. And we've, we've also tried to test the robustness of the results among other reanalysis. So here is the result in ERA interim reanalysis. This one is for UNCEP2. This is for the climate forecast system reanalysis. And the, the final one is the 20th century reanalysis. And you can see that the one-to-one the -one relationship between the low-level moisture and the tropopause. Um, and they tend to agree quite well among the reanal different reanalysis data sets, but, uh, except for the 20th century reanalysis, because um, you can see that the 20th century reanalysis always tend to overestimate the tropopause potential temperature by about 5 to, K uh, to 10 K degree Kelvin um, in the upper, in the upper uh, troposphere, lower stratosphere. And this arrow could be due to the fact that these, the 20th century reanalysis only assimilates the surface, um, the, the observations from surface, uh, surface pressure with no constraint uh, from observations at the upper, upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. And similarly, um, a one-to-one -one relationship is also found in the, in the southern hemisphere extratropics. So, what about the interannual variability? So, um, by interannual variability, we're talking about uh, monthly anomalies. So, for each month, I'm removing the long-term average for that month, and that's left with monthly anomalies. And I do the same kind of correlation for the low-level um, theta e fluctuation anomaly versus the um, dynamic tropopause potential temperature anomaly, and um, so for now, I'm looking at only in the northern, northern hemisphere first, and uh, northern hemisphere summertime versus northern hemisphere wintertime. And you can see that it's actually very different between the two seasons. 
and in particular in northern hemisphere, summertime, there is a strong moisture of uh, tropical pass kind of co uh, relationship in northern hemisphere, summertime interannual variability, which is characterized by a correlation about, uh, above 0.6. Whereas the moisture tropical pass uh, connection almost completely disappears in northern hemisphere wintertime. So what about the southern hemisphere? So here I'm showing you the, the, um, the interannual variability in southern hemisphere summer and southern hemisphere winter. As you can kind of expect, there is less of a seasonality in the southern hemisphere. And the, the moisture tropical pass relationship kind of works, but it's kind of on the weak side, and the correlation is about only about 0.2 to uh, 0.3. So one of the things that's interesting to us is that why the distinct behavior in, um, be in northern between northern hemisphere summer and northern hemisphere winter. And um, one hypothesis for this strong moisture tropical pass kind of relationship is that it's probably because of the uh, existence of the strong Asian monsoon circulation um, in northern hemisphere subtropics um, summertime. On the contrary, in northern hemisphere winter, there might be a strong, strong influence from the uh, large scale circulation in the stratosphere, which could dominate over the influence from the low level moisture and to see whether these are true or not. So here's what we do. So first of all, why there is a strong moist tropical pass connection in Northern Hemisphere summertime. And by doing so, we make use of an existing model simulation from Shaw 2014. So um, it's a um, CAM5 aqua planet model simulation. So this is the SST forcing in the control simulation, and it's zonally symmetric everywhere, and the maximum of the SST is shifted to about 10 degree north to try to mimic the uh, northern hemisphere summertime. And on top of that, we have this perturbation experiment where it imposes a, a zonal wave number two SST perturbation in the northern hemisphere subtropics and it tries to mimic the land-ocean heating contrast in this idealized framework. The original purpose in Shaw 2014 was trying to understand the abrupt seasonal transition of the northern hemisphere general circulation. So for, from, northern, from winter to summer, there's an abrupt seasonal transition in terms of a dramatic expansion of the southern hemisphere headly cell, as well as a northward shift of the northern hemisphere jet streams. But for, for, for here, the, our purpose is to see whether in this kind of idealized framework, if we can produce, reproduce uh, the strong moisture tropical pass uh, connection. And the short answer to this is yes. So, um, so this is the, the results from the control simulation, the low level fluctuation of theta E versus the tropopa, dynamical tropical pass potential temperature. And you can see with a zonally symmetric SST forcing um, the correlation between the moisture and the tropical pass is on the weak side, is only about 0.2. Um, 0.2 the correlation coefficient. However, as we introduce a, a, a monsoon-like SST perturbation in the model simulation, a strong correlation starts to develop between the low-level fluctuation of theta E and the, the tropical pass potential temperature. Um, on the right plot? Uh, um, because um, as you impose a, um, a, a wave number two SST perturbation, first of all, it induces the, the eddy component. The, and the eddy, eddy component can further modulate the mean, uh, the, mean, the mean flow, the mean theta E value, and it increases that as well. So we are, we are, we are now still looking at these two uh, simulations, but we are thinking that uh, if we uh, in, in this monsoon-like SST perturbation, the theta E distribute, the daily theta E distribution not only, shift, not only widens because of the um, introduction of the eddy component of the SST, but it also shifts towards a higher, a larger value 
um, in terms of the mean theta e. The, the, oh, it's, it's also included here. Yeah. Oh. Mean part is bigger, and also the, the, the variance is bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both are getting larger. So, um, so second, so why the moisture tropical path connection almost disappears in northern hemisphere winter time, and why hypothesis for this is probably is become because of the large scale circulation in the stratosphere, and um, there have been some studies trying to relate the residual circulation to uh, better understand the meridional structure of the tropical paths, and um, the mechanism is kind of like the stratospheric cooling in the tropics. Would give give a rise in the tropical tropical paths, whereas the the brood absence circulation induced the warming warming tries to push um, the extra tropical tropical paths uh, to uh, uh, push uh, to sink. So to see whether this works or not, um, to explain the the interannual variability of the extra tropical tropical paths, we again we calculate uh, uh, the brood the string function associated with the brood absence circulation and also the, the vertical velocity of that. And then we, we try to correlate the vertical velocity associated with the brood option circulation with the tropical path potential temperature. And here's what we found. So we found that in northern hemisphere summer, there's no correlation between the two as we can imagine because of the very weak uh, brood option circulation in the stratosphere in this season. But a negative correlation starts to develop between the large scale circulation in the stratosphere and uh, the tropical path potential temperature. And in particular, if we have a, a large uh, uh, descending motion associated with the BC BDC, then it ends up uh, with a, a negative anomaly of the uh, tropical path potential temperature. So hopefully, I've, I've found the right answer for, for this, for the two distinct behaviors in the two seasons. And um, so in northern hemisphere summertime, the strong correlation is likely due to the, the, the strong Asian monsoon circulation, whereas in northern hemisphere wintertime, it's largely modulated by the stratospheric influence. Um, so in, in the next few minutes, I will briefly talk about how this is actually represented in um, uh, state-of-the-art climate models, in particular SIMIP-5 models. So here, I'm making use of uh, 27 SIMIP-5 models that's with available daily uh, temperature and uh, uh, specific humidity. And um, I'm plotting the result, the, the 27 multi-model averages in red, and you can compare that to the reanalysis, which is in black. So in general, the multi-model averages are able to represent this one-to-one -one relationship between the low-level fluctuation of theta e and the tropical path potential temperature, except for some systematic code biases at both the lower level and upper level. Everything is shifted towards the colder side. And what's more, we, we have found that there are 12 out of the 27 models which also underestimate the slope of the annual cycle. And this could be another uh, serious problem in terms of, the, rep in terms of uh, the model's representation of the moisture processes. Because um, if, you look at, if you look over here, that some of the models can actually have similar values of low-level theta e as that of the reanalysis in northern hemisphere, in northern hemisphere summertime. But these models still cannot, uh, cannot produce as large tropical path potential temperature as that of the reanalysis. And that might have some implications for maybe something is missing in representing the moisture processes or something is inadequate um, in, terms of, uh, model, in terms of modeling. So um, back to the cold biases. Um, here I'm plotting the results for the 27 SIMAP5 models, um, and the, the reanalysis is plotted in um, the black arrows right here. 
So um, here are the results for northern hemisphere annual averages. And you can see here that most of the models are kind of on the cold side as you compare to that of the reanalysis. And uh, the, the, cold, the cold bias is at the lower level could be as large as five to six degree K. And uh, um, at the upper level, in, um, in terms of the tropopause potential temperature bias, it could be as large as seven to eight degree K. Um, it turns out that this has been known as, um, as the general coldness of climate models that has been, um, that, that has been there for, uh, since the first IPCC assessment report. Although the, uh, the magnitude of the cold biases has been kind of, kind of reduced maybe from 10 to uh, 15K now to um, 6 or 7K degree K uh, in some of five models, but still the cold bias still exists um, and the mechanisms still remain elusive at this moment. Um, and what we are showing here is that in Northern Hemisphere annual average, as well as for other seasons, we see that there is a uh, significant, significant correlation between the cold biases at the lower level and the cold biases at the upper levels. And first of all, it supports the, the, this uh, proposed moist, uh, moisture tropopause kind of relationship. And secondly, it might point to the possibility that if we can somehow reduce the cold bias at the lower levels, we could some possibly reduce the cold biases at the upper levels as well. So um, although the, the study is primarily based on the overall performance of the CIMIP-5 models, but here just to, since I'm coming to NCAR, so I just want to point out the NCAR model, which is the, C, the uh, CCSM4 that I've been using in the study and it's doing a very good job in terms of um, the cold biases. And you can look at the three GFDL models, which, are, um, which have uh, uh, serious problems in terms of cold biases. So, um, and, and, and finally, I, I, I try to attribute whether, I, I, I try to attribute the cold biases in the low level of uh, theta E fluctuation into its mean contribution and the eddy contribution. And it turns out it's mostly from the cold biases in the mean um, time, um, monthly and zonal average of theta E. And further, I break that into the cold bias in temperature and the dry bias in specific humidity, which are shown here. And as you can expect, it's the combination of the two. So the cold biases in the lower level is a, um, is a result of cold bias in mean temperature and the dry bias in the mean specific humility. So um, just try to sum up here. So um, we have proposed a new um, moisture tropopause relationship that relates uh, a large fluctuation of low level, fluctu uh, low level uh, theta E to the tropopause potential temperature. And it turns out it's uh, working successfully in explaining both the annual cycle of the extratropical tropopause and also the interannual variability, um, especially in Northern Hemisphere summertime. And that's likely due to the strong Asian monsoon circulation. So we've also tested the representation of the relationship in some of five models. And we found that the multi-model averages are able to do a good job in terms of representing the one-to-one -one relationship except for systematic cold biases in all seasons. And the cold bias turns out to be um, a, a systematic uh, across different, across most models, some of five models as well. And in addition to the cold biases, we have found that part of the models also underestimate the sl slope of the annual cycle, which might have which might suggest possible issues with regard to the representation of the moist processes. And um, hopefully throughout the talk, I'm able to convince you that um, this, th this is a useful, use useful uh, diagnostic tour in order to better understand the dynamics of the tropopause. Although we, of course, we need more uh, numerical sensitivity experiment to better understand the processes. Okay, that's the end of it. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have questions? <clears throat>
what you want here. Yeah, very, very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. It's, oh, I have two questions, actually. Yeah. So, uh, so does that relationship hold for the different latitude, like a polar region? You compared the 30 and 40, so mostly subtropical region. Um, I, yeah, I, I guess if we only, if, if we look at the extra tropics, I, I, mm -hmm. um, um, if you look at the extra tropics, uh, in terms of the annual cycle, it's very robust, regardless of any latitudes you are looking at. And uh, if we look at the interannual variability, the largest correlation actually takes place in the subtropics, with some latitudes at um, maybe mid latitude or higher latitudes as well. And that could be related to uh, uh, the, the warm conveyor belt or something like that. But um, the largest correlation actually take place in the subtropics. Yeah. So, uh, and the other question is, uh, the what is the time scale of that relationship hold? Like, uh, if you go deep into the weather weather time scale, uh -huh. does that still hold? Or? Yeah. So that's something I. Um, I'm still working on right now. So here, uh, all the results are monthly averages, right? Uh, but we've also looked at the, the weekly weekly time scale, uh, which is kind of like the, uh, the weather time scale. And we found uh, a, a strong correlation as well. And in terms of the time scale, we found that the, um, the, the tropical pause uh, potential temperature variation tend to delay um, uh, take place after the low level fluctuation moisture uh, within five days. Yeah. So it, it also works on, on smaller time scales. Yeah. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I had a question about, so your relationship there with the two sigma is predicated on that being the 10%? the sort of mean plus 10% or the 10% of the mean is that right that's um, where it came from right the 10 the the 10% of the stream function 10% of the stream function yes so but it didn't didn't look like it the 10% of the stream function seemed to be a pretty good fit for the tropopause not this um the 10% there was no latitude shift there wasn't any of that when you showed or did i miss something on those plots that was my question Right, I shows that for um, when I when I compare the um, the dynamic tropical paths with the ten percent of the maximum stream function. Right, right. And then it, you did the same thing for this. Right. And it didn't look like it matched. Right. Because it was um, that latitudinal offset. That's right. I think the this latitudinal offset is 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 primarily because of the horizontal distance that the air puzzles travel. When you tr when when the puzzles are lifted upward, um, so so we are trying to use this one to um, approximate to give an approximation for the ten percent of the of of the maximum stream function. Um, okay. Right, the ten percent of the maximum stream function is kind of at the upper level, so it better matches with the dynamical tropical paths. But this one is at the lower level, so we need to introduce the, uh, a certain degree of latitudinal shifts to get the two uh, equal value or similar value. Okay. Yeah. I, I would really appreciate it if you comment on the physical, the physical picture of mm -hmm. your diagnostics. So there, as you said at the beginning, there are a number of different ways of um, 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 attribute what maintains and uh, creates the mid latitude travel parts, for example. Right. So your specific diagnostics, how how does this fit in this picture of different diagnostics? What's specific physics you're trying to emphasize? Um, right. So um, I think some people emphasize on the dry dynamics. Some people emphasize the, um, the importance of the stratosphere. And uh, here we are 
is trying to uh, qualitatively measure the contribution from the low level low level um, uh, moisture or low level uh, fluctuation of theta e and uh, um, if 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 you look at the this the the relationship it turns out to be a large and rare fluctuation of theta e that's able to rise more or less adiabatically to the height of the tropopause and modulate the tropopause potential temperature. So um, I think that's something that's something unique that we have found. Yeah, so Right. Um, I think so far, I, I, um, I, because of the diagnosis, I cannot really separate if it's really the co moist convection or it's the large scale uh, circulation that's doing this kind of transport. But I suspect it's maybe the, maybe the, maybe both. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? But does this relationship hold for the trop tropics, trop tropical tropopause? Well, I, 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 think, I think it works. Um, I think if we go down to the tropics, then the eddy component of theta e will go just to go to zero, and it's moist eddy back. So the theta e, the mean value of theta e is now equal to the uh, the tropopause potential temperature. Just eddy component goes to zero. So it yes, it works in the tropics. But it might not fit the seasonal cycle in the tropics, right? Because there's there's a large annual cycle in the tropics, but not at the surface status of E. Well, that's right. Um, that's right. Um, yeah, I, I I haven't looked at that yet. That's the next seminar, so we'll come back. To that. <laughs> Thanks. Other, other questions? I, I agree. This has been a really stimulating talk. I think it's really nice work, and thank you for coming. And thank you. Let's thank her again. Thanks.